Well, good morning, EBC family. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as you are aware, unfortunately, due to uh, uh, high numbers of COVID in our congregation, uh, the elders and I felt uh, the need to be able to hold online only service today just so that we can prevent the virus from being transferred any further. I know that, uh, you know, there's different things. The, the, the virus isn't as potent, um, these kind of things, but we still want to uh, take it seriously. I actually tested positive again. Uh, this is the second time that I've had it. I feel fine. Um, and so maybe it was a false positive. I don't know. Who knows? Um, I'm doing okay. Um, the family's doing okay, but uh, we just want to take it seriously. But uh, we, while we felt it's kind of a shame to uh, cancel on Mother's Day of all days, uh, we also felt that uh, contracting COVID isn't uh, really a, a good gift to give to your moms. And so uh, it's probably all for the best. But uh, thankfully, uh, everybody in our congregation who has uh, contracted COVID uh, seems to be doing well. And so we praise God for that. And so uh, keep praying for each other, keep praying for an end of COVID and uh, wisdom for the elders and I as we continue to basically tread these waters and uh, try our best to be able to um, uh, just kind of guide our church through all of this. It's it's tough times, but uh, that said, Lord willing, um, we're going to be back next Sunday, which again is a very uh, special day. Uh, we're going to be Lord willing, having a church dinner next week at 4.30 in our, uh, in our gym, which will be followed by a presentation by uh, uh, Caleb Jabello, who is a uh, church planner in Papua New Guinea. And so I uh, got a chance to speak to this brother this past week, and I praise God for him. And uh, I'm looking forward to having him with us. And so, uh, but if you would like to help with that church dinner, we still are planning out on it. Um, and uh, I know it's... Uh, uh, one of those things, uh, I just, uh, we want to kind of stay on track as much as we can, but if you would like to help with that dinner, uh, you can talk to June Skiff and uh, she will, uh, she'll put you to work. But uh, that said, um, a few other things that are going on next Sunday at 1230 as well, over at the Congregational Church, we're going to be having uh, a meeting for the uh, sports camp. Uh, sports camp is coming up this summer in July. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, you can talk to Diane Barlow. Uh, talk to myself and we'll get you uh, all involved in all of that. Following week, uh, the 22nd uh, will be our annual business meeting. So if you're a member, uh, make sure that you uh, join us for that. And, uh, and then uh, the following week after that, uh, we will be having a Memorial Day choir uh, here. Uh, uh, practice for the Memorial Day. Um, Sarah and I are putting together a choir to be uh, able to sing at the Memorial Day, Eastford Memorial Day ce uh, celebration, the ceremony there at 930. And so if you'd like to sing or be a part of that, uh, just let us know. Or you can show up at that, uh, at that practice <clears throat> and we'll put, you, uh, we'll put you on in there. But that said, um, I do apologize for not having music today. Uh, we just weren't able to put that together because it was kind of last minute decision. Um, just because we found out a lot of people had COVID kind of last minute, but uh, let's pray today and then we will get into the word and Lord willing, it'll be a blessing to all of us today. So let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for another day that you've given to us your day uh, where we can come and we can uh, uh, even, even online, God, uh, Lord, uh, this past couple of years have been uh, just uh, an interesting one for all of us. And Lord, our, our desire is not to get anyone sick and to take this virus seriously and uh, to love our neighbor as ourself. And so Lord, while it may, may indeed be frustrating to, uh, to uh, not be able to gather again today, Lord, we know that it is in your hands. And so Lord, we pray that you would just uh, heal those who are uh, struggling with COVID. Uh, God, that you would... Uh, just uh, give them uh, the strength and the grace, Lord, that they need to get through it, Lord, including myself. And um, Lord, I pray that you would uh, just use this in the life of uh, our church and in our personal lives to honor you and glorify you. But Lord, I pray for your blessing upon the word today. I pray, God, that you would nourish us with it and just give us a good time together this morning in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me. We're going to continue our study through Hebrews chapter 2. Um, I know today is Mother's Day, and I know that uh, a lot of pastors, they will do um, kind of Mother's Day sermons and, 
uh, you know, and I've done those in the past. I think that those are, are great. I think that we need those special times. As a matter of fact, I was praying and thinking about um, doing a Mother's Day type sermon uh, this past week, but um, just felt the need to be in this particular passage today uh, to continue on through our expository study through Hebrews. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at just the first four verses of uh, Hebrews chapter two. And so follow along with me as, as we read. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to by those who heard it, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. This is God's word. So um, really interesting text today, but, uh, but before we get into there, just kind of thinking about it this week, I was, I was thinking about uh, Old Sturbridge Village, okay? Weird thing for me to be thinking of when I uh, read through this passage. Old Sturbridge Village, I think the great majority of us who uh, have lived in this area maybe have gone to Old Sturbridge Village once or twice, and for those of you who might be tuning in from elsewhere, Old Sturbridge Village, it's the uh, largest living museum, that's what they call it, a living museum in New England, which basically, if you go there, it basically is a, is a small little town which is uh, meant to recreate rural New England around the 1700s, okay? Uh, what a rural New England town would look like in that late 1700, 1800 period. And so uh, when you go to Old Sturbridge Village, you, you walk around, you see all the old buildings and uh, people there who are... Uh, uh, trying to make the, the experience as authentic as possible, okay? They dress up as blacksmiths and tin workers and uh, basically show you what life was like uh, back in those days. But I think one of the coolest parts about uh, Old Sturridge Village, for me anyways, is uh, the buildings. I love walking around there and taking a look at the buildings because uh, many of them are actual structures that were actually built during that time period that had actually been taken and transplanted to that site in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, okay? The, the, these, these structures, these houses, all of these things were actually taken and put there in order to have that, that authentic feel to Old Sturbridge Village. One of my favorite buildings of uh, uh, Old Sturbridge Village, of course, is the big white uh, meeting house, the church building that's there if you've ever been there. And if you uh, take a look at their website, you find that that building was uh, first constructed in 1832. It was a Baptist meeting house which of course means a lot to me, uh, very similar in architecture to our own um, Baptist meeting house here in Eastford, actually the original part of our, uh, of our building here, our, our actual, the, the, the part of our building that uh, has the steeple on it, the original part was built in 1847. There was actually a, a previous meeting house that uh, was built in uh, the 1790s, but then was torn down and then built uh, this other stru structure in the uh, in 1847, completed in 1847. So very similar uh, architecture between the, the building in Old Sturbridge Village and, uh, and our own. But what's cool about uh, the one in Old Sturbridge Village is that while it was built in 1832, it was later deconstructed and then relocated to Old Sturbridge Village and, and then reconstructed there, just like a lot of the structures, as I said before. And, uh, you know, again, uh, that's what really makes Sturbridge Village really what the special place that it is. Uh, you know, all of these structures kind of kind of being authentic and real, having been deconstructed and then reconstructed. And, and of course, these buildings, they take a lot of maintenance and require a lot of upkeep in order to keep them in uh, tip top shape, in order to keep them, uh, keep it, you know, just the, the authenticity of, of uh, Old Sturbridge Village. But with that said, while the concept of uh, deconstruction and reconstruction of those old buildings, it's kind of cool. I, I enjoy it. I'm, you know, i enjoy uh, construction things and uh, used to work doing that myself. But while that's kind of cool, unfortunately today, the idea of deconstruction has moved well beyond physical structures and now unfortunately is applying to spiritual structures, okay? There's actually an entire philosophical movement out there entitled deconstructionism and its proponents and they have almost a evangelistic ferocity, okay? They seem to be encouraging those of us who grew up in the church those of us who are Christians to deconstruct 
uh, to tear down our Christian faith for one reason or another. Okay. And many famous Christian leaders, they have indeed deconstructed over the past couple of years. Most notably, uh, the author of the very well-known book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, Joshua Harris. Many of you may have read that book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Uh, it was certainly a part of my uh, uh, walk with the Lord uh, later on. I read it. Uh, it was a part of uh, my growing up in Christ. But uh, despite having been influenced by, by, by Christians, you know, in influencing and and being influenced by many Christians uh, throughout his pastoral ministry and, and really having that deep, deep impact on so many, so many of us as uh, young Christians. Josh Harris, he no longer considers himself to be a Christian. He's actually walked away from the faith completely. Uh, he, he is no longer a Christian. And he is now part of this deconstruction movement uh, to the point, and I know I've mentioned this before in previous sermons, um, uh, it was, happened a couple years ago, and I think I mentioned it during another sermon, where Josh Harris now is offering a class that he teaches entitled the Deconstruction Starter Pack uh, for those interested in deconstructing their faith from Christianity. And it'll only cost you about 275 bucks if you're if you want. You can look at that at churchleaders.com. Okay. Um, yeah, he uh yeah. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out, but uh hopefully you're not. But uh that said, turning our attention to our text today, looking at what God's word has to say. Um, I bring up this topic of deconstruction because uh it, it it's what happens today when we indeed neglect our salvation as the text states. If you don't maintain your Christian faith, it's going to fall apart. Just like a building that's not well-maintained uh, makes it worth nothing. And thus the only option is to deconstruct it. If you're not gonna maintain that building of your faith in those ways, it should just be deconstructed. When you don't pay close attention as the text states to your Christian faith, it's gonna fall apart. You will drift away as the text states. And so the title of our sermon today is The Dangers of Deconstruction, The Dangers of Deconstruction. And as I said in the first sermon here in, uh, in the study through Hebrews, uh, the book of Hebrews has two basic themes that run kind of parallel with one another side by side through this book. The first being the greatness of Jesus, as we saw last week, and the other being the need to persevere in the faith, which is what our text is all about today. Our, our text today is, is the first of many, many warnings that we're going to see throughout the book of Hebrews about how easy it is to drift away from the faith in Jesus Christ, to deconstruct. Uh, and at the same time, the same passage is an admonition. It's the same time an admonition to persevere, to pay much closer attention to our spiritual walk so that that drifting away, that deconstruction might not happen. So that's what we're going to look at today. And so jumping into our text, we see a couple steps that the author outlines uh, that are going to lead uh, someone to deconstruct or drift away from the faith. A couple dangers, as it were. Danger number one, a failure to pay attention to your drifting. A, pay, a failure to pay attention to your drifting. Notice verse one, it says, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. Now, one of those basic rules of biblical study when uh, you, you come to a verse that starts with the word therefore is asking, what is the therefore? Therefore, okay, that's a good thing. When you come to the term therefore, Ask yourself, what is the therefore, therefore? And so, as we saw from the last sermon, the author is building upon the argument uh, that he was making in chapter one regarding, regarding Jesus being greater than angels. We talked all about that last Sunday. As, as I said, the original readers, those Hebrew Christians, many of them were putting their hope all in angels more than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the author is correcting them. He's pointing them back to Christ, showing them how amazing Jesus is, which again, we went over last week. And by the way, we're gonna go over, over and over again throughout the book of Hebrews. It's not the last the text that we're going to see about the greatness of Jesus, okay? It kind of goes back and forth between this idea of perseverance and the greatness of Jesus. So we're going to see both of those things. However, with that bad teaching, with that bad theology about angels and, and taking their eyes off the gospel, taking their eyes off of Jesus, those, those early Christians were slowly drifting away from the truth. They were slowly drifting away from, from God's truth. They weren't paying close attention to what they had heard, what they had been taught by their trusted pastors and Christian teachers. Uh, they weren't paying attention to that correct doctrine about Jesus Christ and salvation, but instead were being duped into believing things that were blatantly false. 
that were that were obvious false doctrine. And so we have to ask, what exactly were they not paying attention to? What was causing them to drift away? What exactly were they being taught? Well, first and foremost, we see in verse two, if you take a look, it says, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, um, and we're going to stop right there, since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable. And so to understand that verse, you need a little bit of context, of course, as we always do. At the time, it was pretty well understood that angels were responsible for bringing the law of God to Moses, okay? And the Old Testament brings that out fairly clearly, that angels were involved in Moses uh, getting the law for the first time, bringing the law of God to the people of, to the people of God. And, and that's based upon their understanding of Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses uh, 2 to 4, which, which reads this. It says, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us, and he shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came from the ten thousands of holy ones, mark in your mind the term holy ones, with flaming fire at his right hand. Yes, he loved his people. All his holy ones were in his hand. And so they followed him in his steps, receiving direction from you when Moses commanded us a law. And so there is a clear connection between the giving of the law and God's holy ones, which is indeed a reference to angels. Okay, God's holy ones are angels. Dr. R.C. Sproul uh, commenting on Deuteronomy 32, he states the following. He says, this is likely a reference to the angels of the heavenly hosts surrounding God's throne. The New Testament also mentions the role of angels uh, in giving the Mosaic law. That's his commentary on that particular verse. And so the author's point in bringing angels into this, once again, that concept of the angelic is, is that rather than putting your faith in angels, put your faith in the word of God. Put your faith in the word of God, by the way, that, that those angels brought down from heaven and gave to Moses, okay? It's not, it's not the angels who are reliable, but rather the message, as he says, the message that those angels gave on behalf of God that is reliable, which also ultimately points to Christ. So we saw last week, and again, we'll see again in the future as we talk more and more about Jesus. But more than just angels, though, the message was proven as the latter part of verses three and four states when, according to verse three, it was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to us by those who heard while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And so through those angels, the Lord declared, as it says, the message of salvation to those who heard. And more than that, he confirmed that message through all of the signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts that were displayed by the power, according to this text, of the Holy Spirit at the time. And again, um, th this goes back to our study through the book of Acts when we, when we read, if you were here for all of that, uh, when we were in Acts, we read about all of those amazing miracles and that uh, all those first century Christians that, the, that uh, all of those Christians were able to perform in order to basically authenticate the, the authority and the message of the gospel that they were preaching. That, that the message that they were preaching was indeed from God and not just something that they were made up on the fly. Okay, that, that they were able to perform miracles, signs, gifts, and wonders in order to authenticate the message that they were saying. Those signs and wonders, those miracles, that, which, by the way, as we looked at when we went through Acts, uh, it included the ability to speak in foreign languages that they hadn't studied in order to be able to share the gospel with those of a different tongue, so we call speaking in tongues. The ability to cast out demons, as we've seen. The, the ability to heal diseases. All of those gifts, all of those things were given in order to show everyone who saw those things the power of God in order to draw them to faith in Jesus Christ and be saved because that's what saves us. It's not miracles. It's, it's, it's not all of these sign gifts. It's faith in Jesus Christ. Many of those first century Hebrew Christians, they, they would have actually seen um, those, those miracles firsthand. They would have actually seen those miracles actually take place. Many of those who, who would have been addressed here in this book, they would have seen miracles actually take place. They would have witnessed the power of God through the miracles of tongues, healing all of these things they would have seen those things firsthand and those declarations those attestations those the, that 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 witness as the author calls them those are things that that he is calling those hebrew christians back to and first and foremost he is calling them back to the word of god as i said before not the messengers of god's word but the word itself to stand alone on the word of god and not the words of anyone or anything else not angels nothing else so that's the first thing that the author wants of his people but secondly he wants to point them back to the power of god the actual experiential nature of who god is that they have personally experienced in their own lives 
That's his point, that, that if they would pay attention to those two things, if they would pay attention to the word and what God has done in my life, that they would be saved from that spiritual drift, from that deconstruction, as we are calling it throughout this sermon. And folks, really nothing has changed today. Really, I'm going to say that. You know, we, we too, every single one of us, including myself, have a strong propensity to drift away from God. All right? And that drift, I'm just going to tell you this, it begins when we neglect God's word. It begins when we neglect this book. And by the way, in neglecting this book, secondly, it begins when we forget all of the amazing things that God has done for us beginning, by the way, with the miracle of our salvation, okay? If you want to begin the deconstruction process spiritually in your life, if you want to start drifting away from God or, or, or mom and dads, I'm going to say this, I know this is Mother's Day, so I got to apply it that way, moms, dads, if you want your kids to drift away from God, neglect God's word. That's a good way to do it, all right? Stop reading God's word. Stop studying God's word. Don't do family worship. Don't do family devotions. Don't come to church where God's word is being preached. Don't give any instruction in the home. Don't bring your kids to Sunday school. Don't bring your kids to adult Bible class or don't go to adult Bible class yourself. Again, those are very, very good ways to start down the path of deconstruction, to start drifting away. And why is that? Well, because once we drift away from God's word, once we drift away from this book, it becomes easier and easier to forget about all the things that he's done for us. All those things that he has, has worked in our lives over the years. For the Hebrew Christians, they drifted away from God's word and, and, and thus in their struggles, uh, in, their, in their persecutions and all of the things that were going on in their lives, they, they turned their hearts to lesser things. They turned their hearts to angels instead of Jesus. In their neglect of those things that they had heard from God's word, as it says, they were drifting away from Jesus to other things, to lesser things. And they're neglected God's word. They, they'd either forgotten about or most likely diminished that miraculous power of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ that was shown in their salvation uh, through faith. And so I would argue this, is that, that this drifting away was, was not something, again, that happened suddenly to the Hebrews, but rather it was a, it was a gradual drift that happened over a period of time. It didn't happen suddenly. And I think that's why the author uses the term drift away. You notice that in the text, it says drift away because it has that idea of a slow move, uh, inch by inch, moving slowly but surely away from the truth and entering into deeper and deeper, just the, the slough of lies, the muck of lies. Okay, the Hebrew Christians, they, they would have certainly, they would have professed faith in Jesus Christ. They would have considered themselves Christians in this particular case, but due to false teaching, due to bad theology, which, by the way, didn't openly contradict God's word, but, but kind of slowly kind of came up alongside. It mirrored God's truth that, that the people were slowly pulling away. That's what was going on in the text. And that's why it was being written. Okay, they, they, they were slowly drifting away. They were slowly deconstructing their Christian faith in light of this falsehood that they had been presented with. And folks, I'm just going to say this, is that that's how Satan works today. It's always how Satan works in order to destroy Christians and indeed destroy churches, okay? He slowly and gradually, he, he injects small pieces of, of false teaching into the believer's life, into the life of the church, confusing a little bit, maybe even using scripture or spiritual talk to kind of get us off the path. I would say this is that very rarely does Satan attack us directly. Very rarely does Satan attack a Christian or a church in an open, hostile way. Instead, he's very, very crafty. He slowly, he slowly creeps in. He inches little by little from Christ. And, and that slow drift is, is, is why churches are in the state that they're in today, I would argue, by and large. Churches that were once preaching the, the, the truth about Christ, the truth about sin and the salvation from that sin now are affirming the very sins that God hates and condemns in his word. That slow drift is why you know, churches have taken their eyes off of Jesus and are instead, they're more concerned with, you know, everything else. I mean, you name it, you can find a church that's uh, concerned about it, especially in regard to politics, both on the left and on the right. Okay. You got churches that are, that are, that are so concerned with politics that they have taken their eyes off of Jesus. It's, it's why, it's why we see so many Christians or professing Christians anyway, that, that are, that are uncommitted that are kind of middle of the road, shallow Christians who like to say that they love Jesus, 
but they live every day in outright hostility to his commands. But that's the reason why we, like those Hebrew Christians, we need to, as, as this text states, pay much closer attention. We need to pay much closer attention specifically to God's word and keep the gospel central, which, which, which means, yes, we need to be concerned with Bible study. You, as a Christian, need to be concerned with theology. You do, both on a personal level and indeed as a corporate level as a church. We need to be concerned with these things. Yes, we need to think about how, about and, and really lay out what we believe, why we believe it, and then stick to it. Not be mushy or wishy-washy on these things. We need to confront false teachers who come into our midst and be very, very careful who we allow to teach or what we allow to be taught. These are very, very important things. Because when we are not paying attention, as the author of Hebrews states, when we are not paying attention to those things, that's when the slow drift begins, little by little, little by little. And so the application this morning is this, is to avoid deconstruction, to avoid drifting away, to pay attention, to give heed to the word of God as you have always been taught. If you know what God's word says about something, then live that way. And don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. Don't let them try and convince you otherwise of what this book has to say, because it's very clear. Don't give into the slow drift of sin, because, because before you know it, you will have drifted so far away that you won't be able to see the shore again. That's what happens. You know, it's like little by little, here's the line, I'm not going to cross it. And then, well, I'll cross it, you know, just a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit. And then before you look back, you can't see the line anymore. That's exactly what the author of Hebrews is talking about. Stay true to God's word, Christian. Pay attention to God's word and God will indeed guide you and he will keep you from that slow drift. That's my prayer for myself and that's my prayer for you. But next, I think the greatest way in which deconstruction, which this drift away happens, takes place in not taking God's judgment and his wrath seriously. Danger number two, not taking God's justice seriously take a look at with me at uh, the second part of verse two into verse three it says every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution and how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation so again context the author is is making the point that the angels that the angels were the ones who helped in bringing the law to the people and and in that law the punishment for transgression or disobedience of the law was found Okay, as the author points out, I mean, God is a God of justice. Okay, he is a God of justice. He gives just retribution for sin and disobedience and indeed neglect of the law. Okay, you're going to get punished if you neglect the law. If you, if, if there is a just retribution for disobedience. In the Old Testament, if you've ever read the law of God, okay, Genesis through Deuteronomy, the Torah, you, you know that if you disobeyed God's law, the just retribution could be very severe that the justice that should take place upon you is, is very, very severe. It could cost you your very life, depending upon the offense. And some of you who are with me each and every morning, uh, right now we're in the book of Numbers. Uh, we're reading through the law of God. And so you know, during that daily Bible reading, as we go verse by verse by verse, you know what I'm talking about, that the just retribution for every transgression or disobedience of the law was sometimes very harsh. Okay, very, very, very harsh. And so what the author is doing here is he's taking that and comparing it to a New Testament context. Comparison to Christianity, comparison to faith in Jesus Christ, to so that great salvation that he's provided. If we neglect that great salvation, if we set it aside, if we take advantage of it, how shall we escape? If you as a Christian who knows the word of God, you know the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You know the gospel. You, you, you know all of these things. And yet at the same time in that knowledge, neglect that salvation. If you put it aside and you live however you want, and you do whatever you want, what will be the result? How shall you escape God's just retribution? Well, the answer is you won't. If you neglect, if you pull out from, if you drift away from Jesus Christ, either by word or by action, by the way, which we're going to see throughout the book of Hebrews, you will not escape God's judgment, according to the author. You won't. In other words, as I have preached in the past, being a real Christian, I preach this many, many times, because it's very, very near and dear to my heart. If you 
if you are a real Christian, okay, being a real Christian, uh, it means it means that yes, uh, you will have faith in Jesus Christ, but that the authenticity of that faith, or whether or not your faith is actually true or not, whether or not your faith is actually real or not, it is shown in your obedience to God and His Word in light of His justice. In light of his justice, James says this, he says, faith without works is dead. Meaning this is that you can tell me all day long, I am a Christian, but how you live your life is the real proof that God has done the work in your soul. You can talk all day long, a big talk about, about Jesus and, you know, but yet if the works don't match up with your claimed faith, it's nothing. If you take the sin that nailed your savior to the cross seriously, and you are in the process of fighting with that sin on a daily basis, striving to honor him in all things. That is the work of God that proves that you are saved. It proves that the Holy Spirit is in you. It proves that you've been changed from the inside out. It proves that you take sin that, that, that should have led you to hell, that should have led you to incur jo God's justice, that you take that very seriously and don't take for granted the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, you're saved. Not perfect. Because that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about perfection, sinless perfection. I'm talking about an overall trajectory. All your screw-ups and mess-ups included. That you are in an overall trajectory wanting to honor the Lord Jesus Christ, striving for him. Remember this. Jesus said this on the Sermon on the Mount. He said in Matthew chapter 7, 21, he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name, do many, many works in your name? And then I, speaking of Jesus, will declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of what? Lawlessness, of iniquity, as some of your translations would say. I like the word lawlessness, okay? Jesus is clear that there will be many professing Christians, many people who call themselves Christians, who, who will call Jesus Lord, Lord in that day, claim to know Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus is going to say to them on that day, professing Christians, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. Meaning this, yeah, you called Jesus your Lord, but you never submitted to him. You never submitted to him. That you are a Christian in name only, right? Then when it came to following the law of Christ and following his commandments, of showing your love for him, you took for granted his grace and you lived in your sins instead. And so sadly, that person will depart from Jesus in that day and incur God's judgment, his justice for all eternity. And brothers and sisters, that's a scary truth, uh, but one that we need to bear in mind is if we're going to avoid spiritual drift. If we're going to avoid spiritual deconstruction, we need to take sin. We need to take the consequences of that sin very, very seriously. Okay. When there is sin in our lives, we need to, to, we need to strive to the best of our ability to fight against that sin. Because much of being a Christian is doing just that. It's battling against sin. When we're saved, we're not made perfect immediately. I wish we were. I, that would be great. I wish that I was sinless. I wish that God would make me that way. I really do. But when we get saved, OK, for, for the remainder of our time here on Earth, the reality is, is that all of us are going to spend time fighting against that sin that that deserves God's justice, battling against sin after sin after sin and situation that will cause us to sin and all of these different things. And then once and once you think that you're all good, another sin comes. Right. And that conviction and that desire to fight against that sin, that's all part of your salvation. That's all part of that sanctification. It's proof that God is in you. It's proof that, that, that God is in you and that he is working in you, that God is convicting you of sin, that his Holy Spirit is util utilizing his word to bring you back around to him, all right? And I would argue that, 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 that when we fall into sin and when we are not convicted of that sin and don't get those sins right, that that's when we need to worry. That's when we need to be a little concerned with where our spiritual state may be. Now, let me just clarify something, okay? I want to clarify right from the get-go because this is going to, topic of perseverance is going to be something that's going to be a major issue throughout the book, okay? Um, it's not going to be the last time that I deal with it, so just prepare yourselves because it's, it's coming again. But just to clarify, I am not talking about loss of salvation here. I'm not talking about loss of salvation here because your works were not good enough. 
So get that out of your mind right now, okay? Uh, we know that those who are truly in Christ, that they are secure for all eternity. God does that through his spirit. He seals us till the day of redemption, okay? That's what he does. And I am also not talking about works-based salvation in any form or fashion, all right? That's, that's, the, the, the book of Hebrews is very clear that it's not by works. Okay, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, no works, no matter how religious, even the Old Testament Jewish uh, sacrificial system that we're going to look at, that is never going to be enough. Even if you followed it to a T, it wouldn't be enough to save you. And the author is going to make that point over and over and over and over again in this book. Salvation is not by works. However, the warning here in this text and in future texts is for the reader to honestly assess yourself sincerely seriously and see whether or not you are truly a christian to see whether or not you are truly in the faith and that's not a bad thing god's word tells us to examine our faith to to, to examine the authenticity of our faith paul states this i've read it before second corinthians 13 5 examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself, he goes on to say. Or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus is in you, unless you fail to meet the test? Very clearly in the text of scripture, we are to examine our hearts. And so spiritual examination, very, very important part of the Christian life. It's something that needs to be done regularly between you and God. Matter of fact, we talked about that last Sunday when we were partaking of communion. All right, we had that time of silent reflection, time where we were taking the, the cracker and the juice and really thinking about what it means, thinking about our sins, confessing our sins. Communion is a good time to be able to examine your heart, to examine your heart for areas where you might be backsliding, areas where you might be drifting, where you may be deconstructing. And that said, can Christians backslide? Obviously they can, okay? Christians do backslide. Absolutely. And I'm guilty of that. 100%, okay? I'm not a perfect Christian. Those of you who walk with me on a regular basis, those of you who know me in the church, you know I'm not perfect, and I don't claim to be perfect, okay? And so none of us are going to be perfect. No, ever. However, if we are truly in Christ, God is always, 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 always faithful to bring us back when we wander, okay? We are prone to wander. Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love, right? I mean, that, that's a very real thing for Christians. And if you walked with God for any length of time, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know exactly what the hymn writer is talking about. There is that proneness to wander. And thus the, the warning for the reader in Hebrews here is to make sure that the faith that you claim to have is authentic, to make sure that it is real. And that, by the way, that it's not just real, but that it's continually growing, even with setbacks, even with issues that may arise, that it's continually growing and that it is founded ultimately upon the truths of God's word, which we as Christians should be and need to be paying close attention to, as the first verse states. And so that said, just in way of application, what, what can we do about all this? Okay, obviously the main application uh, should be to our own personal lives first. All of us should be examining God's word. We should be looking into the mirror of God's word. We should be applying it to our own hearts and lives first and foremost. You don't apply the text of scripture to other people. You apply it to yourself first. But I know this is that each and every single one of us has had to suffer the heartbreak of, of someone in our lives who is deconstructed, somebody who has drifted away from the faith, somebody who might be drifting away right now, might be deconstructing right now and is in the process of it. So what do we do about that? How do we handle that kind of situation? Well, first and foremost, just in way of application, number one, um, I would just say this is see and be aware of those warning signs of deconstruction in others and don't be afraid to point them out, okay? If you are aware or you see a brother or sister Christian veering off the path, maybe, maybe they're doing things that are against God's word, unbecoming of a Christian, your responsibility as a believer, as a loving brother or sister in Christ, uh, is to go and find out what's up, okay? That is your responsibility, okay? I had some very loving brothers who did this to me this week, okay? Area of my life and things that there were questions about, 
Um, and they came to me and questioned me. And I'm very thankful for that. They were concerned about some things. And so they loved me enough to come to me and confront me, point them out. And they were clarified and they are fixed now. Praise God. We praise God for that. But that kind of thing, that, that, that kind of <laughs> just, just uh, not ignoring and not being afraid of pointing out these things, it's hard. It really is. It requires boldness. It requires a humility. It requires a deep love that's not shallow or surfacy. It's a hard thing to talk to somebody about the reality of their faith. Okay? They, they, I mean, again, a faith that maybe from all outwards appearance seems to be okay, but maybe we just see warning signs that, that, that it might be waning or has problems. That, that kind of conversation is, is hard to have. It's awkward. It doesn't feel good for anybody, ever. But in the long run, it turns out for the best. It's the most loving thing you can do for another Christian. I mean, if you saw somebody, let me just say this. If you saw somebody running towards a cliff, they didn't see it, okay? They were just running jet on towards a cliff, on the deep cavern underneath it, you know, and, and they didn't see it coming. You know that they didn't see it coming. What would you do? Somebody that you love. I mean, I know what you do. You scream at them. You tell them, you try to get them to turn around, come back to the path you, th th so that no harm would come to them. And that's what we need to do. So what we, that, that, and that's what we need to do. When we, when we get that inclination that someone might be deconstructing or falling away. If you know somebody is falling away from the faith, maybe you see somebody who hasn't been in church in a while. Maybe you see somebody in your life that, 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 that claims to be a Christian but isn't living for the Lord, is doing things that, that, that are just blatantly wrong or sinful. You need, you need to, out of love, out of a deep sense of love and, and, and commitment to Jesus Christ first, but also out of love for them, point those things out out of love and concern and trust God that they, that they would get back on that straight and narrow path. And so in dealing with those who might be in the process of deconstructing, don't ignore it. Don't ignore it, believer. People who are drifting away, the most unloving thing that you can do for another believer is not say anything. So say something. Go to them lovingly, humbly, and point that out. Number two, Continue to be obedient to Christ in spite of those who may have deconstructed. Now, when it comes to those that we love, it, it can be especially hard to minister to them, especially if they're not living for the Lord the way that they should be, okay? There's always that awkwardness, especially with somebody who's kind of either deconstructed or maybe in the process, maybe they're not living for the Lord the way that they should be. There's always that kind of level of awkwardness between you and them because you don't have the same priorities anymore, right? You go to church on Sunday, they don't. Uh, you don't go to certain activities and places and they do. They do certain things and whatever, and you don't, all right? And so for the Christian, there can be a temptation to compromise or maybe even placate to them and give into their lifestyles, maybe even, maybe even out of love for that person and maybe even in order to maintain the relationship with that person. That can be a very real thing. I mean, good motivations, but I just want to say this, that placating, giving in to those who have drifted away spiritually by compromising in your own spiritual life is that's never, ever the answer. And by the way, it's amazingly, amazingly dangerous to you spiritually. Becoming less faithful as a Christian for the sake of gaining back or maintaining a relationship with somebody, that's not the way to win them. It's a good way to, 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 to actually end up drifting away yourself. It's a good way to end up deconstructing yourself. So don't do that. And I mean, for instance, I might step on some toes, but the, but the most prominent way, I think, uh, to make sure that you continue to send the statement that Christ is first in your life is by being in church. Now, I know today we had to be online because of COVID. And so I'm not saying, obviously, I think that there are legitimate reasons not to attend church. Okay, that's why, that's why we're not meeting today. So don't hear me being legalistic about this. But what I am saying is, is that if we skip church to do activities with those who we want to come back to church, we want to see them faithful. And we skip church and we do these other things alongside them to maintain their relationship. We're not doing them any service at all, okay? If, 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 if you have someone that you love who has walked away from the faith and is encouraging you to take part in, in activities that would take you away on Sunday, take you away from church on Sunday, and then you do it, you're not helping them at all. If you, again, if you continually skip church, it's not going to help anything. You just, you, again, it's, it's that example of putting Christ first that will indeed help them. Okay, and the same could be said for a ton of areas. I just use the example of church attendance as, as, uh, as an example, uh, but there are other things. 
there are things that, that, that you're going to be pressured to do by those who have either deconstructed unsaved Christians or uh, unsaved people who you want to see become Christians, that, that you're going to be tempted to do so in order to maintain that relationship, but you know will dishonor Jesus Christ. But it's our Christ-like behavior and our devotion to God that is going to help to win souls, not compromise. Compromising will get us nowhere except drifting far and farther away ourselves. And so today, as we, as we conclude today, my prayer is that we would be aware of the dangers of deconstruction, as the title of our sermon was today, uh, that we would not be so naive as to think it couldn't happen to any of us, okay? Oh, that'll never happen to me. I'll never fall away, right? Well, be careful about that. First Corinthians 10, 12 states, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed or pay attention lest he fall. So pay attention, Christian. Pay attention to what you've heard. Pay attention to the drift. Pay attention to the sins in your life. And ultimately pay attention to the word of God in Jesus Christ to keep you on the straight and narrow path. So may we indeed take heed, as Paul wrote. Take heed of this warning from, from the author of Hebrews. Strive to build our faith upon the foundation of God's word and do the same for others. Amen. Well, that said, I'm going to pray in just a second. I pray that today has been a blessing to you. Again, I do apologize for, uh, for having to uh, hold uh, devotional online today. Praying for all of you who are sick. Um, praying ultimately for an end of COVID. Praying that uh, we would honor the Lord together and um, that we would, Lord willing, come together next week to be able to honor him and to be able to uh, come together for, uh, for our Lord's Day next week. And, and so get better, everybody. And uh, Lord willing, I'll see you then. But let's close in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for today. I praise you so much for your goodness and your grace in our lives. Lord, I praise you for this word. I pray, God, that you keep us uh, from deconstructing, Lord. Help us to realize the dangers of it, uh, of that slow drift that can oftentimes happen, God, to realize how far we might be. Lord, I pray for those who might be drifting far away from you, Lord, that, uh, that you would just bring them back. Uh, God, that, uh, that you would help them see the sinfulness of sin and the need to be able to repent. Lord, that we be bold in our, in our confrontation of one another, Lord, when it needs be. And indeed, Lord, quick to encourage, Lord. Um, an area of my sermon I didn't really bring out very well. Uh, Lord, the need to encourage one another, as we're going to see later on in Hebrews 10. Encourage one another as we see the day approaching to be able to live for Jesus and to look to him as the author and founder of our faith. God, that we might not become distracted by the things of the world, but instead, God, that we might honor you, Lord, in, uh, in every area of our lives. And so, Lord, I do pray now, Lord, as we, uh, as we close, that your hand of blessing would be upon this word today, that you'd bring us back together this coming week, and God, that you'd get all the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Bye, everybody. Lord willing, see you next Sunday. Bye now.